Today's world appears to present us with unsurmountable problems, a steadily worsening global economy, ever-increasing political tensions, and a climate that is degrading quickly. But if you really think about it, all of these problems stem from a lack of knowledge, be it social, technological, or scientific. Because the more we know, the more we will be able to understand the phenomena that dominate these issues and devise solutions to these problems. That is why I believe that research, including scientific research, which leads to technological development, is extremely important. It is almost impossible to think about our modern way of life without the technologies that have come out of hundreds of years of scientific research. And even those discoveries that seem to be the least applicable to real life may lead to innovation. For instance, you could imagine that Einstein's theory of general relativity might only be of interest to a handful of specialists. But in fact, it is thanks to this theory that you arrive at your destination when using a GPS. Most of our innovations have been based upon varied uses of matter. We are made out of matter, and all of the things that we hold dear are also made out of matter. That is why understanding the nature of this stuff and the forces that act on it has always been one of the great scientific endeavors and has obvious implications for innovation. So let's talk about matter. Sorry, keep on doing that. Um, so I wanted to have an apple for this, but well, for obvious reasons, but I guess that this will have to do. So the reason I can't squish this pointer or distort it easily is because of the electromagnetic force. The strong and the weak nuclear forces keep its atoms from flying apart, and when I throw it up and it falls down, it feels the Earth's gravity. It is made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, all atoms that make up ordinary, or what physicists call baryonic matter. But this is where things start to become strange. The observation of huge clusters of stars called galaxies shows that only 5% of the total mass in the universe is in this usual form. So let's spend a couple of minutes looking at the evidence for this, and now we can go on to this. So it's instructive first to look at the case of our solar system. In our solar system, almost all of the mass is located in the sun. It's a staggering 99.9%. The well-known physics of Newton allows us to predict the orbital velocities of the planets, and we've known for centuries that these agree beautifully with our observations. What we see, and what this animation shows you, is that the velocities of the planets decrease with distance to the Sun, so you see Mercury spinning around at breakneck speed, while Jupiter and Saturn plod along serenely. And we would expect to see exactly the same behavior in galaxies past the point where all of the visible mass is located. Is this actually the case? It came as a big surprise in the 1980s when the velocity of very tenuous hydrogen gas beyond the stellar disk of galaxies was measured. What was seen was that the velocity of the gas did not decrease with distance to the center of the galaxy, but instead remained constant, and in some cases even increased with distance. This is strong evidence that there is unseen material in galaxies, but it is not a mere detail. What we're talking about is a quantity of matter that is a factor of 10 or more than that of the ordinary matter observed as visible stars and gas. Astronomers have come to refer to the surplus of matter in galaxies as dark matter, and they have realized that many other structures in the universe possess this property, from gigantic clusters of galaxies all the way down to the very tiniest galaxies, where in fact the surplus appears to be even more pronounced. So what could this unseen material be? Determining its nature is one of the holy grails of modern physics, given that it will tell us what most of our universe is made out of. Astronomers have been able to reject most hypotheses, so we know that we're not talking about a vast population of black holes or very faint stars, for instance. About the only possibility that remains is that it is some form of elementary particle that interacts only very weakly with normal matter. In fact, if the standard expectation is correct, there are billions of dark matter particles rushing through this room at this very moment and passing through our bodies without disturbing us. So what role does this dark matter have to play in our cosmos? Perhaps not unsurprisingly, given its preponderance, it controls the formation of galaxies, and hence that of stars, planets, and consequently us. We think that we know a fair bit about the early universe. 
we can observe the remnant light of the formation of the very first hydrogen atoms as a faint glow of the sky in microwave light. This tells us that the matter was very uniform at the beginning. Knowing these initial conditions, this allows us to make very detailed computer simulations of how the universe evolved under the gravity induced by dark matter. So from an initial almost smooth soup, regions of slightly higher density tend to feel more the force of gravity, stick together, and attract neighboring blobs of matter. This causes a runaway effect where small structures fall towards slightly larger structures, and so on in every direction. The net result of this is a hierarchical distribution of matter that agrees remarkably well with our observations on scales larger than that of individual galaxies. On the scale of individual galaxies, the simulations predict that every giant galaxy, well, in fact, every galaxy, is surrounded by a gigantic so-called halo of dark matter, which would account for their observed property, namely that the velocities of the planets, oh, sorry, that the velocity of the gas does not decrease beyond the visible disk. This, anim this animation here shows you the endpoint of one such simulation, focusing on a region around a giant galaxy at the present day. What you see is a swarm of tens of thousands of small lumps of dark matter, which are just scaled down versions of the giant dark matter halo in which they live. You can see very clearly that they move around in a random fashion, and their masses turn out to be almost exactly the same as the masses of the satellite galaxies that have been observed around every giant galaxy. So are these predictions here confirmed by our observations? To answer this question, my father and his team turned their attention to the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the nearest giant galaxy to our Milky Way, and that you can even see on a clear night by the naked eye. On this photograph of Andromeda, which covers an angle of about two degrees, so a thumb at arm's length, you can see two of its dwarf galaxy companions. And we know that these are satellites of Andromeda from measurements of their velocities. Over the last 12 years, my father and his team has used the Canada France Y telescope to map out the vast region beyond the disk of Andromeda. This has unveiled a whole new set of satellite companions, but you'll notice that this number is very far from the expected thousands. This deficit has been known for some time and is one of the major problems with our dark matter theory. The team proceeded to measure accurately the positions on the sky, the distances, and the velocities to these objects. I myself contributed to this work by creating a computer program that allowed us to analyze the movements of these tiny galaxies. All of this allowed us to recognize that there was a very special plane that contained half of the satellite galaxies and that showed a coherent sense of rotation. The probability of a chance alignment like this is very small, about 2 in 10,000. So I'm going to show you a little animation that we made to better visualize this structure. We start at our sun and fly out towards the Andromeda galaxy through our southern neighborhood. Well, there's no sound, but too bad. So as we slowly leave the Milky Way, you can see that many of the stars that contaminate our field of view disappear behind us. We're going to stop at a point located about a tenth of the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, just outside the disk of our Milky Way. We show the stars that were detected around Andromeda thanks to our survey and you can see a complex network of streams crisscrossing through the halo of the galaxy. I'm now increasing the brightness of the satellite galaxies that we discovered so that you can see them. And we highlight those in the plane in red. We start turning around this whole system at a constant distance, and you can see that the structure that we discovered is very thin when viewed edge on. We stop and turn off the satellites that lie outside the plane. The other ones remain. Pity there isn't music, actually. Does it add? So we stop now with a face-on view to examine the motions of the satellites. So the Milky Way is off to the left, and you can see that the satellites to the north of Andromeda move away from us, and those to the south come towards us. This suggests a common rotational sense. So then we resume turning and finish close to the point we started our voyage from, and then move out through the Milky Way to a distant vantage point where we'll be able to appreciate the relative sizes so, of the Andromeda Galaxy, the Milky Way, 
and the giant planar structure that we discovered. <laughs> so in a recent study that was published in the journal Nature just a few weeks ago, I also showed that these alignments of satellites appear to be common in the nearby universe. All of these are completely unexpected, given the results of the cosmological simulations, similar to the ones I showed you earlier. So what does this all mean? Basically, there are two options. If dark matter theory is indeed correct, then it appears that the only way to account for this, or these peculiar alignments is to posit that the satellite galaxies that we observe have nothing to do with the dark matter lumps seen in simulations. This is a possibility if the satellites in our planes did not form from dark matter. There is a certain class of galaxies called tidal dwarf galaxies that form when two giant gas-rich galaxies collide, and they contain no dark matter. Their distribution could be planar because they form along giant arcs of gas that are stripped off of the giant galaxies, as you can see here. However, the satellite galaxies that have been observed around Andromeda do appear to be dominated by dark matter, so this interpretation seems difficult. The other option is much more radical. It is possible that our understanding of dark matter is incorrect or incomplete. Perhaps we do not fully understand all of the physical properties of the hypothesized dark matter particle. Or indeed, it may be that our theory of gravity is not fully applicable for extremely low accelerations. Only time and lots of hard work on the part of astronomers and particle physicists alike will resolve this puzzle. So you may wonder whether my research hasn't made the situation less clear and more complex than before. But to me, this is a sign that science is a work in progress, and that we still have much to discover, and hence much to offer to future innovators. I hope that one day my research may lead to a better understanding of matter itself, and who knows, perhaps one day we shall use dark matter in our technologies. Thank you very much. Wow.